Welcome back to part number three of Relationship Goals. My name is Joe. I serve as lead pastor here at New Freedom. Whether you're joining us online or in person, we're so glad that you have chosen to spend these next few moments with us. Before I begin, let me just uh, say thank you to Pastor Nate for standing in for me last week. Uh, Part number two, if you have missed any of the uh, parts of this series, they're uh, chronicled there on our website. You can go back and you can watch those. And I really encourage you to do that so that you can see how each message builds upon another. Uh, We made a decision years ago that one of the core values of New Freedom Church was going to be relationship. And being in relationship and connection with one another is vitally important. We are relational beings. God made us to be in relationship primarily with Him, but also by default, we're in this world with other people and we need to be in relationship with others. And so this relational God set about creating humans within the confines and context of relationship. And today, we're going to talk about marriage, and we're going to talk about sex. And we're going to do so in that order, because that is God's divine order. But uh, before we do, let me just share with you something that is uh, what I have heard all my life, the three toughest topics to discuss in mixed company. If you just look around, you realize that we don't all sit at the dinner table together. We are in mixed company. And those watching us online, uh, we don't know, you know what table that they sit at. But it's, it's okay because God has drawn each person uh, for a time and a season. But there are three topics that I have always been told that you never talk about in church. And one is money. The other is politics. And the third one is sex. Now, I know that those, those trifecta kind of all go together, don't they? <laughs> Money, politics, and sex. But today, I think it's important that we, as the body of Christ, discuss topics like this because this is what is being talked about in our culture. Your worldview and your mindset is being framed by someone or something. And so if the church doesn't engage upon these topics, then the only education that our congregation, our people, our adults, and our children are ever going to get is that which comes from the bombardment of the world. And so we want to talk about from a biblical perspective what God has to say about these topics. And today we're going to talk about marriage and sex. Relationship is so vital and being a core value, this is how that we get to know one another and we grow in our faith. And so just a a little uh, plug for some of the relationships that you can build here at the church is that we have small groups for all ages. We have classes that have started weeks ago. We have classes that are ongoing. We have some that are starting yet this week. Um, I'm actually going to be hosting on Wednesday night, all the month of March, a series, a study in the gap room on uh, the miracles of Jesus. It is, it is talking about the wonder-working power of Jesus. So if you need to experience a miracle, then this would be a, a great time for you to come and be part of that and to build in some relationship. So these three areas, let's talk about this this morning. When was the last time, let me ask you this question. When was the last time that you heard a really good love story? Now, for some of the men in the room, they might say, never. I don't even watch Hallmark with my wife. I don't even like those stories. Never heard a good love story. Well, there are some wonderful love stories in the Bible. In fact, the Bible is a love letter written to you. It is God's heart on page to you so that you read the old covenant and the new covenant and re- realize what God has in store for us. But all throughout the scriptures, you have a story like Jacob and Rachel is a beautiful love story or Ruth and Boaz. The Song of Solomon is a, a short book but it is a love story. The entire book is a love story. It represents God's love for Israel, the love between a man and a woman, but ultimately it represents the relationship between the church and Jesus. It is a foreshadow. It is a picture of what was yet to come in the future. We'll get to the love, the song of Solomon here in just a a few moments, but, um, the best, the epic, the, the top of the hill love story is Jesus going to a cross on a hill, on Golgotha, and dying for you and for me. The ultimate love story is that God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. This is the ultimate love story. And all of these examples that I just named, and you can read them in your Bible, all of these examples punctuate the kind of relationship that God really wants to enter into with you and I. 
It is not some usual relationship, but God has a covenant relationship in mind. And the kind of covenant that God has established with us is a blood covenant, but it is based upon agape love. Agape love is the God kind of love. It is unconditional love. Somebody just say that, unconditional love. There are no conditions to this. Covenant language is used all throughout the Old and the New Testament. Or let me say it like this. This book contains an old covenant and a new covenant. It is covenant relationship. And so more about covenant in just a minute. I want to talk to you about the difference that we understand between covenant and contract. Now, most of us would be very familiar in our culture with something like this. A contract lines out and spells out for us the rights and the obligations of one party to another party. A contract is very familiar because we, we know that there, there are some, some languages in here, some things that, that we must do and some, some uh, obligations we must uphold. And we sign at the bottom of a contract saying, I will do this if you will do that. A contract is how our culture operates. Contracts are not bad. Contracts actually can be very good in business dealings in dealing with with things like purchases, in dealing with things like long-term agreements. Contracts can be very good. Let me share with you a couple things that a contract does. It summarizes the understanding between two people. So what does a contract do? It just summarizes, it lines out the understanding between two people. Here's what a contract says. This is what I have to do. A contract says, if you do your part, then I'll do my part. In a contract, there is this sense that I'll meet you halfway. A contract is once all of the stipulations have been fulfilled, then the contract is met. In a contract, someone asks, well, what will it take? What must I do to get the deal closed? This is contract type of thinking. But when it comes to your relationship with God, when it comes to how that we relate with the Heavenly Father, there is no, hear me, there is no, absolutely no contract language in the Holy Scriptures. None. There is contract thinking many times, but there is no contract language in the Holy Scriptures. What we find in the Scriptures, rather, is covenant language. In ancient times, In order to enter into an agreement with someone and to let your word be your bond, there would be many kinds of covenants that they would enter into. In ancient times, a salt covenant was often uh, demonstrated how that two would come into agreement beyond a contract. They would take this salt and each one would have their own instrument of salt. And when you and I would come into contract, I would bring my salt, you would bring your salt, we would make an agreement, and then we would just do this. Now, can anyone come up here and separate the granules that came out of my jar into this jar? Impossible, isn't it? This is an illustration. This was a simple way to say that once we are in covenant, there is no separation from that. Salt was more than just something that would be added to food to taste good. Salt was a preservative. Salt was vital for life. Salt was how that you were able to make sure that you could season your meat and your food, that you would have a lasting enjoyment of it for another day. Salt was so valuable that it was exchanged like currency. And so when I exchange my salt with your salt, when I come into biblical covenant with another, what it means is all that I have is yours and all that you have is mine. And so we together can never, ever be separated. That's why there is absolutely no contract language when it comes between our relationship to God. And that should also apply in how we view brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. Now, the the very height of covenant that we see displayed is the blood covenant. You can read this in Genesis chapter 15. I want to just briefly overview Genesis 15 because next week, if you come back, I want to share with you Genesis chapter 16, and we're going to talk about relationship holes. We've talked about relationship goals. Next week is relationship holes. I'm going to show you the biggest 
baddest, most destructive relationship in all of the scriptures, and it entered into with the same person who started between God and this blood covenant named Abram. He later on got a name change, Abraham. So if I say Abraham, I'm just using his, his more modern updated name. But in Genesis chapter 15, we see the story of Abram, a man who was an idol worshiper coming into relationship with Almighty God. This was dramatic, this was drastic, this was revolutionary, world-changing, because a promise came from God to Abram that he would be a father of many nations. Yet he didn't even have offspring of his own, and so he questioned God how this could be. He was getting up there in age and well beyond child-bearing years, and he realized that this was not likely to happen, but yet God had given Abram a promise. And so to to sanction that promise and to bring that promise to fulfillment, God said, we are going to cut covenant. You ever heard the term cut covenant? It comes out of the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. And so what God instructed Abram to do, this was familiar in ancient times, is that he was to take a heifer, three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old goat, and a three-year-old lamb. Also, some turtle doves and and another bird. And he was to take the the four-legged animals and cut them down the middle, cut them in half, lay each on either side opposing, and the person who was going to promise the covenant in this day would walk between the middle of those two slain animals, thus signifying that between you and me, there is no difference, that we have cut covenant together. Now, you can imagine that if you cut three-year-old animals. These weren't small animals. If you cut them in half, this is going to take a little bit of labor. It's going to take a little bit of work on Abram's part. And that's what God commanded him to do. You cut them, you go and get them, you cut them, and you lay them on the side. And there's going to be a lot of blood that is going to be shed from this kind of a sacrifice. And usually each party would walk through the middle sanctifying this, the, the covenant and saying, yes, I agree to this. But something odd happened. After he lays out the animals... Abram falls into a deep sleep. And the scripture tells us that the Shekinah glory came down from heaven and God himself walked in between the middle of those animals. God himself was the promiser of the covenant. He was making the covenant with Abram and he was the one that was going to uphold it. So let me share with you what a covenant says. A covenant says, not I have to, but I want to that I'll do my part whether you do yours or not. A covenant doesn't say I'll meet you in the middle. A covenant says I'll give 100%. A covenant is this, I will continue to do my part of the deal as long as there is breath in my body. Not as long as the stipulations are met, but as long as I have life, I will fulfill that covenant. The blood covenant goes on from this point all throughout scripture culminating in the cross of Jesus Christ where by his blood we were made partakers of the heavenly vision and the divine nature the blood covenant but until we get to that time because Abraham lived about 1800 years before Christ Christ walked the earth about 2,000 years. So we're talking about a 4,000 year, give or take some years, type of an agreement between God and man. All throughout those 4,000 years, we have many things written to us about God, about relationship, about people here in the scriptures. But we have so many powerful demonstrations to understand covenant. And God has given us one that is, is eternal. It is uh, life-changing It is one that God holds so dear that he demonstrates it time and time again, and it is called the marriage covenant. It's not a marriage contract, it's a marriage covenant. Because in a marriage covenant, what happens is that a man and a woman come together and they share their lives. When they share their lives, what the man has and what the woman has come together into a container, and the container is called marriage. So a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. They shall become one. So the picture here is the marriage covenant. And within this covenant, within marriage, I will tell you that there are some things that happen within marriage 
that cannot happen anywhere else in, in the world. Marriage is the container for sex. So marriage is the sex container. This is God's idea. Sex isn't a dirty word. Sex is exciting. Sex is God's idea. It's just that what happens is when we want to get things out of order, out of focus, when we want to do things our own way, then there are damaging results that follow. And so if we keep sex within this marriage container, within this container, then we see all the promises of God in him are yes and amen. Let me just say something about God when it comes to covenant. When he says a prohibition or when God gives us a no in scripture, it's not so that he takes away our fun. God's not a killjoy. He's not trying to, to limit you from having a good time. But usually, I would say every time, whenever you see that God tells us no, he's telling us don't hurt yourself. No, don't hurt yourself. That's what he's saying. It's like any good parent will tell a child, don't touch that hot stove, you'll burn yourself. But like most of us, we have to try and see and feel and know what that feels like ourselves. And though it pains the parent's heart to let those little toddlers go off and walk, though it pains our heart when they fall down and they scrape their knee, though it pains our heart when they reach out and touch that hot stove, it is absolutely necessary for them to experience the consequence of that pain. We cannot shield them from all the pain, nor does God limit our choices or take away our experiences and consequences when we say yes after he has said no. So marriage is the ultimate covenant that we see God establishing between a man and a woman that when we come into that covenant, we start to understand what it's like to be godly or to be like God. In covenant language, God is saying, I love you, I bless you, I do good for you. There's no if clause in the marriage covenant. In Christian marriage, we usually assemble people together and we call them witnesses. But really, there is only one witness that even matters in the marriage covenant, and that is God has witnessed the union. There is no contract language when you think about the vows that you took. You probably recited some vows when you got married. There's no contract language in those vows. Let's look at it. I, groom's name, take you, bride, to be my wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and health, to love and to cherish until death do we part. There's no contract in that. It's all covenant. You might say, yeah, what, what if she's not nice to me? You said, for better or worse? What if her, her food is always burned and she doesn't cook really well? You said for better or for worse. Just hang in there, it will get better. A little more practice, a little more time, buy her a recipe book, but not at Christmas and not on her birthday. Do it at a special time, just do it, do, do it any other time. Just, just, just be patient for better or for worse. See, marriage is the place where you learn to be like God through sacrifice. And there are only two ways that that covenant can be broken. It's either through abandonment, the person leaving and not re restoring and returning to you, or through adultery. And I will say, even in those cases, it's not an imperative that you have to break the covenant. Now, I'm talking to you about the one you're on now. I realize that in, in our day and age, there are people who have they, they've broken hearts and broken relationships and broken lives, and I'm not downing anybody for that. Your past is your past. I'm talking about from now on. From this day forward, now that you have this knowledge, now you can be a relational and a covenantal person. God disproves so much of contract thinking. He actually illustrates many times throughout the parables of Jesus people who had contract thinking with covenant expectations. I think about the, the story of the, the, uh, the workers that went out into the vineyard. The first one went out in the morning time and he agreed for a certain wage, said, yeah, that wage would be good. Another, another worker came about noon time and he said, I'll, I'll work for you. And he was given a wage and he said, that wage would be good. And then another worker came about five o'clock at night and they were gonna quit in about an hour of work. And he said, I'll agree to that wage. And it, when it came time to settle the debts, the guy that started first in the morning, what's he thinking? 
I'm going to get a big old paycheck. I've been here all day. The guy at noon's thinking, I've been here a pretty long time. That guy that got here at five, sorry for him. He don't get much. But what did Jesus do in illustrating this parable? He illustrated covenant because when it came time to settle the debts, all three workers got the same wage. Now you say, that's not fair. Well, covenants don't have to be fair. They had contract thinking because they were basing their reward based on their work. And it's not what you do, it's what God has already sanctioned. That's why God has made this covenant. Marriage is where we become sacrificial, we become understanding that we operate like God. And so looking at this covenant, whether it be the salt covenant, whether it be the marriage covenant, there are some things that we can learn about our modern day questions we have regarding marriage and sex and even sexuality. I think these are important things to talk about because the world is talking about them. The church needs to be informed about these things. And so I wanna take a few moments and I just wanna answer some questions that have been pre-selected. I wanna answer some things, I wanna wanna pose you some some things to think about and I'm, I'm here to tell you I don't have all the answers. I know that there are complexities to these topics that, that go well beyond my pay grade, and I'm sure many of you still, still wonder what in the world do we do with this quandary, but there are some things we can know, and so we should know what we can know. So the first question I want to address is this. I kind of teased this a couple weeks ago, but here's the question. Is it okay to do pretty much anything sexually if it's with your spouse? Fair question. I think this is, this is something that people want to know. And I think that what we should do is we should observe this. Where the scriptures speak, we should speak. Where the scriptures are silent, we should not speculate. We should be silent. And so let's just hear from the scriptures for a second. Song of Songs. This is in your Bible. Chapter 4, verse 16. Awake, north wind, and come, south wind. Blow on my garden, that is the fragrance may spread everywhere. Let my beloved come into his garden and taste its choice fruits. I'm sorry if you're blushing, but that's in your Bible. Proverbs chapter 5. May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breast satisfy you always, and may you ever be intoxicated with her love. That's all scripture. Hebrews chapter 13 says, marriage should be honored among, among all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and the sexual immoral. So really, when you look at it, there's not a whole lot of prohibitions that I can find when it comes to sexual activity between a husband and a wife. However, there are some things that are absolutely not acceptable, and that would be multiple partners within the marriage relationship. The real popular uh, connotation, we think it's a modern day thing, it's been around for, for ages, is, is open marriages or, or, or swinging relationships. No, that's not, that's not permitted. Nor would any kind of extra partner be permitted in your marriage, whether real or imagined. Imagined people in your marriage would be that which we see through our eyes, that which we lust after in our heart. Whether we ever take it to our hands and to a physicality or not, we can set up imaginations and strongholds in our minds, and so that is not acceptable. So there's not many boundaries, but here's what you have to do. You have to be respectful of your spouse. You should talk about what you're comfortable with and what you're not comfortable with, and if your spouse is not comfortable with something, then it should not be part of your romantic life. And that, again, is also a form of sacrifice. Next question. Is it okay for us to live together since we plan to get married someday after all? So I believe there's a strong case that can be made that it's always wrong to live together before marriage. And there's multiple reasons for that, not least of which would be when God says, no, don't hurt yourself. That's probably one of the main ones. However, as strong as I lay this out, all the proof texts that I give, I know people are still going to do this. I remember talking to my childhood pastor who had been pastoring for over 30 years by the time I was looking to get into the ministry. And he always had a rule that really was inherited from his pastor and from his heritage is that he would never officiate a wedding ceremony for two people who were currently living together or what they would call living in sin. And I asked him about that one day and I asked him, what what are some of your biggest regrets in ministry? And he said, if I had it to do over, 
I would not have made that vow to my denomination and to my church that I would never marry people living together. And I was curious about that, and I wanted to know more. And as pastor, I, I realized that, that it, it makes absolute every piece of sense to help people do the right thing when they are in a bad situation. And by saying, no, you're a leper, you're damaged goods, I will not marry you because you're living together, is the wrong answer. Because they're trying to right a wrong, we should help them as the church of Jesus to right the wrongs, amen? And so he said he regretted that, and I understand why. I also understand in his heritage and background why he said not to do it, why he didn't do it. But regardless of, of what we think about it, there are some scripture admonitions to us, but, but I just want to share with you that there's a very popular pastor recently who so eloquently illustrated by saying, I am going to create a ceremony for those who want to cohabitate. And here it is. I, David, take you, Brenda, to be my cohabitant, to have sex with you, to hold you responsible for half of my bills from this day forward as long as our arrangement works out. I will be more or less faithful to you as long as my needs are met. And if nothing better comes along, I commit to live with you for as long as it all works out for me. Amen. That is the typical ceremony that could be done and will not be done for those that want to just simply try it out for a while. Kick the tires, test things out, see if it works. Well, again, God says, no, don't hurt yourself because what you're doing is entering into a contract, but marriage is a covenant. Living together is a covenant. And if marriage is the container for sex, that's the only place that it will take place uh, that, that's the only place that it will be beneficial for you to operate in that. So let's look at some verses. First Corinthians chapter 10 says, so whatever you do, uh, so, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God and do not cause anyone to stumble. You may be absolutely minding your P's and Q's. You may be living in the basement while she's living in the upstairs and you are never coming together sexually, but you're living together and you may be causing somebody else to stumble. Someone may be watching your example and they may be little eyes and little ears that are watching your example. Don't cause anyone to stumble. First Thessalonians 5 and 22 says this, abstain from the very appearance of evil. How does it look? You might say, well, I don't care. People shouldn't judge me. They do and they will. So how does it look? You, as a Christ follower, should avoid even the appearance of something that is evil. And again, it comes down to this word respect. It comes down to honor. That if you love someone, you will honor their reputation. You will do the right thing, and you will sanction that union in the eyes of God through marriage covenant, of which he is the number one witness. Remember this, you're building a life story. So what kind of story do you want to tell five years from now, 10 years from now, 12 years when your children ask you, what kind of story do you want to tell? Think about that. Next question. This is important. How much of my sexual past should I reveal in a new relationship? So for many people coming together in a dating kind of relationship, maybe thinking about marriage, they've had other relationships in the past. And, and this is an important question. How much of my past should I share? So the Bible is very clear that we should not lie. The Bible is very clear that we should be honest, that we should be truthful, especially if it comes to dealing in uh, our heart matters with someone we intend to spend the rest of our lives with, someone that we are looking at marrying. Uh, and so... If there is a lifelong issue that will affect your future spouse, if they're going to inherit some children as a result of your union, if they're going to uh, inherit some other things, maybe something that they catch as a result of union with you, then you should be upfront about that. You should be honest. However, when it comes to the intricate details, I don't think that they're helpful in this case. You don't have to talk to your prospective spouse, your, your engaged person about the exotic long getaways that you took with your last relationship. You don't need to go into all the details. In fact, that could be more harmful than it could hurt. And here's the grace that if you're receiving this information from someone, you have to have is that you have to know Jesus makes people brand new. Jesus makes all things new. Second Corinthians 5.17 says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation 
that old things have passed away and all things have become new. And that's important. And so be gracious, be honest, be respectful, be humble. But before God and that person you may be considering marrying, share what is important to be shared. Not all the details, but share what's important to be shared. Last question for today, and then I want to close here in a minute, is this question. Is same-sex attraction a sin? People say, much has changed since the Bible days, so surely God wants me happy and wants me to follow my heart. So is same-sex attraction sin? I know these are deep waters, and I don't have all the answers. There are biological, philosophical, physiological, psychological, all kinds of aspects of this. But I just want to deal with the theological because that's the only part my degree is in. I want to deal theologically with this topic. And if you want more information on this topic, there is a book that was written about two years ago by a man named Preston Sprinkle, and it's called People to be Loved. People to be loved, not a problem to be solved, people to be loved. It is one of the deepest dive theological books I have read on this topic. But I will share with you that being same-sex attracted is not, hear me, a sin. Being same-sex attracted is not a sin. So the answer to that question is no, but taken to the wrong place, taken to the acting out on those desires is in fact sinful. And when we define sin, sin is that little three-letter word that we all have in common. I said we all have in common, but nobody wants to talk about. Because when we talk about sin, what we want to do is look through a periscope at other people when really, when we talk about sin, we should let God use this as a looking glass and we look to our own lives. Sin is simply, in Greek terms, the word is hemartia, which means missing the mark. I have sinned, you have sinned. We have probably sinned differently. Some ways we've sinned the same. But we all have missed the mark. When we hit the mark, it's like an archer that takes that bow and he puts that arrow right in the bullseye, then we have hit something that is what we would call perfection, which we know we're none perfect, but we have walked in the pathway of blessing. When you miss the mark, when you sin, you are outside the confines of blessing. And so taken to the next logical step, if that attraction is, is acted upon, then it enters into a place of missing the mark. So same-sex attraction is not sin. When I was, when I was a child, I was attracted to stealing things that were not mine. By the time I was 12 years old, I was a kleptomaniac. I was stealing things that were not mine in stores. And finally, the day came when I had to pay up and fess up because I got caught for that. And I was sitting at 12 years old in the police station calling my parents saying, come and get me. I was attracted. I had that sin nature, which we are all born with these desires to do things that are not God's way. That's why we have to be washed in the water of the word. And so I had a consequence for that. And so same-sex attraction, while it is not sin, taken to the next logical place, will lead to sin. Again, marriage is the sex container. And all throughout the Holy Scriptures, all throughout 66 books, you will find no positive affirmation at all for same-sex attraction. You will find no place where marriage is anything other than a man and a woman coming together in holy matrimony. And so all sex must take place within the marriage container, the sex container. Now, someone says, well, you're being hateful. You're being bigoted. You're being religious. You can call me anything you want other than the last 20 years. That's how it's always been defined throughout history. And that's what God says. That's what the word of God tells us. And I understand that this is a a quick brush over. This topic could be dealt with and has been dealt with for many, many hours. And here's what I'd make an appeal. If you are struggling in this area, don't be shameful of it and hold on to that and, and, and bury that. You need to come and talk to someone. 
Just three weeks ago, I sat down and I had coffee with someone who emailed us and said, how does your church think about someone who's in a same-sex relationship and is really questioning their sexuality? And I said, before I answer that question, when are you available to have a cup of coffee with me? And we sat in the lobby and we talked. I wanted to hear the person's story because the person is valuable to God. And sometimes people need to talk about what's on their heart. And so if you struggle in these areas, please open up and talk to someone. Next part of this question is, well, things have changed and doesn't God want me to be happy? Well, God doesn't want you to be miserable, but no, he does not always tell you to follow your heart because your heart can take you into a bad place. Your heart, the scriptures tell us, is deceitful. Let's look at, at a couple of verses. Galatians 5 and 19 says, now the works of the flesh are obvious. We don't even have to question it. Be like me saying, did it rain this morning? It's obvious when I look outside that it rained this morning. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That means they're not going to walk in the place of blessing. Jeremiah 17 and 9 says, the heart Shouldn't I follow my heart? Well, here's what Jeremiah said. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? No, you can't always just follow your heart. God doesn't want you to be miserable, but he's not primarily just interested in your happiness because happiness is temporary. God wants you whole and in wholeness, you can have joy. You can have peace. You can have covenant relationship more than just contract, going from one lover to another lover, going from one bad environment and relationship to another bad environment and relationship. God wants you whole. So I close with this, Romans 10 and 15. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after he had said before, this is the covenant, everybody say covenant. This is the covenant that I will make with them after these days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. He adds, their sins and lawless deeds I will remember no more. God is all about covenant. God wants to cut covenant with every single human that has ever been born and ever will be born. And when it says after these days, it's talking about that event that happened 2,000 years ago when Jesus went to the cross and became the ultimate sacrifice for sin. He became the blood covenant for us. And when we come to the communion table and we take communion, what we're saying is that we are accepting that blood sacrifice to the drinking of that juice and that his body is broken. And so we take that bread and we say we are in alignment with God. We are in covenant with him. With heads bowed and no one looking around, I just wonder this morning, have you come into covenant with the living God? Are you in that right relationship before the Lord that you can stand and say that your sins have been forgiven, that your transgressions have been covered? If you can't, then today is your day. Grace and mercy is beckoning you and God wants to extend his offer of salvation to each and every one of us. So first, I'm gonna pray for those who have never stepped into covenant with God, that this would be the day you do that. Secondly, I wanna talk to those who at one time or another, you made a decision and you came into covenant with God, but you've drifted a little bit. You've gotten a little bit shallow in your faith. Maybe you've allowed the pandemic to take your eyes off of things that were really important and and you've just kind of been drifting along, going through the motions and you know that you're not as close to God as you once were and you wanna come back closer today. You want to enter in a fresh and a new with that covenant kind of God. You are done with contract thinking. You want to be in covenant with God. And so you would just take that step of faith to say, receive me again, Lord, into your covenant. That's what he wants to do. For the word of God tells us that we have Jesus Christ, the righteous, that if we sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us pray together. Father, today I pray for everyone hearing this message that first of all, those who have never entered into covenant would say, today, I repent, forgive me. I accept Jesus. I accept his sacrifice, that blood covenant I come in to relationship with God through the shed blood of Jesus. If 
you prayed that prayer today, we believe that you are born again, that God has created a new beginning on the inside of you. And you need to let somebody know that you prayed that prayer. But secondly, I pray, God, right now for every person who has drifted, every person who has known and tasted to see that the Lord is good and his mercy is forever, but we are not experiencing that mercy. I pray for those that just need to come back closer today that they would do that. Draw close today to you. Forgive us, God, for our transgressions. Forgive us for the sins that we've committed. Forgive us from wrong thinking. Put us back on track again with you. We give to you our lives, and today we give to you our hearts. 